Well, good morning, Vietnam. Vietnam is one of our new listeners, so thank you. Vietnam, the country. I don't know if there's people. Maybe the intelligence service of Vietnam is listening. Who knows? Do you get some secrets? Um, if you follow, this is Jim the Keys bartender coming from Key Largo. I guess I could have done that. That's my call sign. Keys bartender. Uh, uh, WKBBS. Keys bartender bullshit. That'll be the uh, call sign. I I guess I shouldn't say that because, well, it's not an airwave, so I can say, this is WKBBS. KBBS. This is Jim on KBBBS coming to you from Key Largo. Yeah, there you go. That'll be this call sign coming in. So it's uh, once again a beautiful day here in Key Largo. And I, I'm, life is good. And I am endeavored to do, an, uh, to do this show without mentioning that thing we have done over the last going on, oh gosh, a year and a half. So I'll try not. I'll try not to do it, and I'll see how well I do. But Because one of the things I'm going to talk about without talking about it. Oh yeah, Jim, you can't fucking do that. You, you can barely stay on a topic. Can you? Well, we'll see, won't we? So, as I said, it's beautiful down here. Uh, I, I, I endeavor to tell the truth, or I'm aware that it's very good to tell the truth. How's that? So, yesterday, the restaurant I work at, a wonderful restaurant, the Catch Restaurant in Key Largo, Mile Marker 102, had to close because one of our key employees uh, lost... A parent, and when I really feel bad uh, for that person, and uh, they they were scheduled, and the other person who would cover for them uh, was committed to doing whatever they were doing on their day off, as many of us have done. So that, as with many small businesses, when you lose one person, it could, and especially a specialized person that you can't open without, you're up Shit's Creek without a paddle. Oh, I used the title of a show that I, I, I watched during the thing that we did over the last year and a half. So we, uh, I, I was working, I was scheduled to work a double from open to close. It works out to be about a little over 12 hours, 12, 13 hours, depending on, you know, how late. No, 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 rarely on a Monday does it go 12, 13 hours, but um, it does go 12 hours. That that I can say. And luckily I can do that at being almost 60 years old, six zero. But yesterday we did not have access to the key employee and stuff like that. So we had to provide value for that day. You can't just uh, not do something when you're a small business. You got to do something to improve. So what we did was a little uh, thrown together improvements, like a little painting that you really don't want to do a day before. When you open every day, you can't do painting because you can't have that paint smell. People, people, you know, some people have aroma allergies or whatever, things like that. It bothers them. And it's not Necessary fresh paint is not always the best thing to have around. But we did, we did a little painting, some deep cleaning, some organizing. Uh, with some of these small businesses, I told you about my thing of tchotchkes uh, around the bar. I just threw out a whole bunch of shit because I am not a big believer. And it just collects dust and stuff like that. People, obviously people like to have, some people like to come in and see signs and stuff like that. But I've been in places where you have shitloads of uh, lined up of beer bottles and all all these things uh, all over the place, and you just it just have to clean those things. Nothing like having a flat wall that you wipe down with, you know, the kind of paint that you can uh, run a rag over. You don't want to use flat. But well, I'm not talking about that today. So we provided value by doing stuff and 
and, and doing some improvements. So, and uh, they are open today. And I never know. You know what? It's funny. When I'm talking, I'm doing this show live and I do it under a sign of hope. How, what do you mean a sign of hope? Well, what I do is I don't, um, I, I really don't have any check see if this is recording. All I have is a, a microphone indicator. It tells me that it's picking up a sound. And I'm assuming since it's live, it's just picking it up. So it's five, almost six minutes into the show. And I didn't say about, talk about the thing, but I will be talking about this thing eventually. Even though I'm not going to say the thing. So, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, what I have been talking about for the last couple minutes or from the beginning, then uh, congratulations on waking up from your 18-month-old coma. You know? Because what I was talking about was a medical thing. And what happened over the, the last 16 months, I'm going to say 16 months, but we started hearing inklings of it in September coming out of a large Asian country. I, I did not say I wouldn't talk about China. So it's out of China, out of Wuhan, uh, where it originated from. The, the first detection occurred because, you know, like I said in previous shows, history will pretty be pretty good depending on who's in charge of history at the time. When I say who's in charge of history... It's like Western civilization, right? When they wrote, uh, when when history was being written, Rome and Greece and Mesopotamia was considered the pinnacle of early ancient civilization. That's kind of redundant, early ancient. Ancient civilization, let's say, the development. But China was left out. But if China was the one doing most of the writing, then China would have been the, at the forefront of ancient civilization because they, at the same time, they were developing too. So we're not going to go that way. But what I'm suggesting, I mean, when it gets big enough, usually uh, these civilizations, the people's, uh, what would you call it? I'm looking for the word. Their chauvinism towards only reflecting on the civilizations they see as their heritage. You know, because really, when I say chauvinism, I don't mean, I'm not doing his woke bullshit. Remember, I've said in previous podcasts, whenever a civilization has the opportunity to subjugate another civilization or another people, they usually do it. And it has no restrictions on different, what, uh, the non-scientific, like, you know what I think about race. I don't believe there's actually... Uh, there's no scientific basis for race. There's different characteristics. People having dark skin, darker skin, lighter skin, depending on where they reside. Oh my God, my phone's ringing like crazy here. Ah, uh, I hate to turn it down, but that looks. This looks distinctly like a business call, but I'm not going to take that. They can leave a message because you know how important I think you are, especially since I'm doing a live podcast. I really can't stop and take the phone call. Or yeah, and I can't really take the phone call and do the show because I don't know who's on the other end of the line. And I have to ask him, hey, this is Jim. I'm doing a podcast. Um, would you agree to let me have my end of the conversation on the line? How's that sound? But I can't do it. So maybe maybe it's someone else. I don't know. I can't take your phone call. Uh, and if you are calling and you're listening to the show and you, you, say, you might say, hey, Jim, you're live and it's not coming through. It's probably best to text. It's probably best to text me right now if you have any message for me. So to get back to uh, civilizations, what was my point right here? Uh, I say whenever I don't have a higher or lower view of different civilizations, they're all pretty much assholes whenever you get to height of power because the people that get to the height of power are usually the people that crave power. And they do a lot of crazy shit. 
They do. It's just the way it is. And like I always talk about my race theory, my race theory is that there is no races. It's different characteristics. There's only one race. It's man. It's humankind. And, uh, and humans have been pretty shitty to different types of different people. Really has. If you had a characteristic, they need to say, oh, well, they're less, they're more. They're, they're, we talked about three-fifths of a human. Once you Three-fifths of a human, that's bullshit. They're human or not human. So, so whenever I talk about history, I like to give a little background of the stuff, what I think about civilization, so people say, oh, you're going to shit on our heritage? No. There are some times that people have, in, in certain ancient cultures and things, people just realize that when they have an opportunity to take advantage of another group of people that are less technologically advanced or doesn't have the type of technology that would allow them to be dominant, they, they get subjugated and some horrible shit happens. You know, and when, you know, alliances occur a lot when people realize, well, it'll take a little more effort for us to dominate them. It'd probably be best if we become an alliance and they would, we support each other's goals. And that's where, like, trading empires did really well. Like Venice, Genoa. I'm sure there was in uh, China was a trading empire at one time, pre uh, the age of discovery. China was a, a huge trading empire. They had trading posts uh, pre 1500s, uh, you know, early uh, 1300s and 1400s. China had trading posts along the East African uh, coast. And they, you know, people don't focus on that stuff. And what happened was, you know, the leader at that time of, of China decided that there was too much influence by the merchant class, so they restricted international travel. So I'm getting further and further afield of what I wanted to talk about, history. And how we denote history in, in the end. A true historian will look at all developments at the same time. Meaning that things were happening not only in Western Europe, but in China, uh, Oceania, uh, the Americas. And there, there's just an Africa, obviously Africa. You know, so, you know, the cradle of civilization, which they call, they call it like that because of that's where we focus on the Western civilization. But if you... Scientifically, man developed in Africa. If you believe in evolution, which I am a proponent of, and that the first signs of mankind did develop in Africa. And at one point, uh, a couple tens of thousands of years ago, during an ice age, a small group of humans survived an ice age that if they did not survive, there would be uh, not this type of humans, at least, um, dominant form of the life form on the on this planet. When I say dominant, I'm saying, you know, the dominant. Actually, you know, ants. I think ants. If you put all the ants together, they actually have the same weight as all the humans in the world. So. And I remember some comedians saying, "No, oh, that would be quite a battle between you know." You know, the same weight, you know, ants fighting against the same, you know, the entire human race. Uh, but I diverge. The history of this thing we went through a year and a half, and we're almost 15 minutes into this thing, has led people to be under a tremendous amount of stress. And we're going to find out later in history. The point is history. History will decide, well, history, we hope history will decide how it came to pass and whether it was a naturally occurring thing or something that was developed. It's always the same kind of thing. When you say naturally occurring, it's like the, the uh, 
I'm going to be able to say plague because they didn't write plague down there. The Black Plague in Europe was due to trading. People foresee and and certain parasites coming across and parasites when I say parasites it's things that were on the back you know fleas on the back of rats and there's different types of plagues that occurred but it was exposure of once isolated at one time isolated populations coming in contact with themselves each other with themselves no but when they come in contact with each other you know certain populations develop immunities but in ancient civilization they weren't as mobile just, you know, they, you, you, you rarely had a, uh, a chain of activity that occurred from Japan showing up in, let's say, pre-13th century Europe. But there was some kind of tenuous connection because you think Japan, they traded with Korea and Korea traded with, traded with uh, China and the other Indo, uh, Indochina and then India, and then you had the Silk Road going all the way to Western Europe. So there was a tenuous thing that occurred. And when sea travel developed, then that changed everything. Because then you had people going directly from point to point. You had the Portuguese landing in the 1500s in Japan. And pretty much that's the farthest farthest point that would uh, you know you could get from each other. Right, And that's why native populations were decimated because they were isolated so long. They were isolated and there was no interactions or pathogens that they weren't accustomed to. And your body just said, hey, what is this? And that's where we get all those goofy names, which we said before when I said goofy names. uh, I'm not going to say it. But under the stresses we had over the last... And it really started in March, I think, in the United States. Right prior to St. Patrick's Day, when things started heating up and the weather got rough. And we started isolating and thinking. And and we had a group think mentality of a large segment of the population pondering their own mortality. There was always a section of people that had, you know, severe disabilities and problems that always pondered their own mentality. And you have older people, you know, being when they associate with older people, especially, I mean, how prevalent is the aspect or the concept of death in a place like, and I want to say because we have listeners there, in the villages. It's the largest retirement community in the United States. I don't know if it's the largest retirement community in, in the world, but imagine a whole big community of people that have, uh, you know, very high percentages. I mean, big city of people in 70s and 80s and 90s and obviously got people in their hundreds. And that in various states of advanced age, where every day, a a friend of ours, one of our listeners, I assume Jackie, uh, she is a, works in, the funeral industry, a mortician. And she works up there. And I said, that was a very lucrative place, percentage-wise, to work. You know? It's like being an ER doctor. If you wanted to be an ER doctor and you want to specialize in gunshot wounds, you go to Chicago or, you know, Miami. And you work in their level one trauma center where they send the people with gun, gunshots. And those those doctors are the best doctors you get when you're, you know, in time of war and stuff like that. I hate not to be a downer. You know, my show always seems to be a downer. But I got to talk about the topics that affect us all. So we've all, everyone went through this thing together. We went through this thing together with different perceptions of what was happening. Right? Some people immediately thought it was state-sponsored. Uh, It was an attack on the world, attack on themselves and all that stuff. And they said, well, you know, you know, in that theory, he said, oh, well, we're going to release this and we're not going to, you know, it's going to kill indiscriminately. 
and that's our thing. Well, that doesn't make sense because they were as susceptible as us unless they had the vaccine already and they were giving it to them and they were restricting it. Oh, that's probably some, I should not have said that shit because some conspiracy theorists will come up and say, oh, that's what happened. That's what happened. No, no. See, that's a stupid thing to release in this world. Any type of biological agent because it's one of these things. It's like having <clears throat> a really deadly boomerang bullet and say, oh, this is a great bullet because what happens? It goes through the victim and then it comes right back to you. Oh, and it stops? No, no, no. It's got to it's gotta die out. Or, you know, the momentum has to die out. It, rep- it returns to you at the same force vector that it left. Oh, well, that sucks. Are you kidding me? It's going to fucking hit, kill me. Yes, that's right. Oh, I don't want that. We'll do something else, you know? So, you know, the way to do it is to, you know, something that decimated your population and you survived it, then you release that because there's certain, maybe some some sort of immunity. But, but what I'm saying is you had that one, people believe that. Other people believe that it was blown out of proportion, that it really wasn't anything. And it was a goal in doing it. They were going to make everyone wear a mask. And the mask cart you know, I'm going to make up this thing. The mask cartel is making billions of dollars selling masks. Well, everyone fucking made masks. They were making masks. Remember the design craze? My daughter was trying to make masks. And she did, she did make a couple masks and stuff like that. But it, it's like so many people made masks. My neighbor down the street made some great masks. We still have it right here. Really nice designer mask and all, all over the place. And they said, well, the, and then another person said, the making the mask is a form of control. They're making you put on a mask, you know, to show they're dominant. And then there was a lot of people that said, well, it's a serious thing and it's occurring and we're, we're going to do our part. Now, that's a nice, significant, I'd have to say a majority. Though thin, they held a majority. People said, well, what do we have to do to stop this thing? Which is helpful, right? You always have that thing in a disaster movie, right? Like, remember the Poseidon Adventure. And I'm going to ruin this fucking movie. And if that's your movie that you're holding off watching, well, that's there's tons of better movies. But in the Poseidon Adventure, I'm going to give you a, a little bullet point. And we're going to compare it to the last 16 months. What happens? It's New Year's Eve. People are on this beautiful, huge new uh, cruise liner, right? And in the middle of the ocean. And a tsunami, or tsunami, tidal wave, comes, huge tidal waves, higher than the boat, comes out of nowhere. And if I remember in the original movie, Leslie Nielsen was the, no, maybe not. I can always visualize Leslie Nielsen, a serious Leslie Nielsen, is the captain of the boat. Uh, Gene Hackman's in the movie, and Ernest Borgnine, Shelley Winters. Ah, and a couple other people. I can't fucking remember who they are. But, obviously, tidal wave, cruise ship, what happens? It turns over, it's upside down, and you have all these great carnival amusement things where you have the upside down building. Where people, that was the the main star of that movie was an upside down cruise ship. Meaning, you have to do things upside down. I mean, not the person doing it upside down, but you're walking on the ceiling and the tables that are attached to the floor are hanging there and people are hanging from that. And they, they you know, have, you know, the people that, you know, you don't want to fall when it flips over. The people that fared the best were the people that kind of slid down the side of the boat, not the people that fell 40 feet in the open atrium into the, you know, but they showed a lot of, it was 1970s originally came out and they got a new one with, uh, Matthew McConaughey, I think, that, that one. But the premise was you had a certain amount of survivors. And some of the survivors decided, well, the way to go is down 
to the top of the boat, the boat, the top of the boat. That you, it's now the bottom of the boat because that's where you, they're going to come and get you. And these other people say, no, well, it's upside down. You got to go to the bottom of the boat where the bilge is. And that's where they're going to cut through. So, which they neglected all sorts of things because all the buoyancy is in the air pockets, the air pockets on the bottom of the boat and all the liquid went to the bottom, right? So when you're going to cut the top of all the fucking air would escape, it'd be like one of those, you think of this, you got a, tens of thousands of tons of pulling down. I am getting sidetracked. But once you cut that open, let all that air out, fuck, that, that thing would pop like a cork, killing the person that's cutting through it. Because all the pressure pushing on the, the bottom of the boat from the air is focused right there. And you just, you know, that's just a non-engineer, but my basic understanding of physics. You know, you ever take a, you take a balloon and put it on the water and then the, 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 the most pressure is at the top of the balloon. I mean, it's ready to get out. Or use something hard, you know what I mean? The bottom of the balloon. If you, if you had a container... You put it underwater with air, and you poke the bottom of the container. It kind of may let some air out, not like a balloon thing. So there's no. Let's say it's a solid container that won't force it out from pressure, right? It would kind of still maintain the air is buoyant and would go up. So, but if you poke the t- poke the very top of that container, that air would sh- shoot right out. Okay, so there was. Several groups of, uh, at least two groups of people survived. So at one point in the movie, Gene Hackman sees a group of people uh, led by the first officer, I think, and they're heading the other direction. And he's looking at it and he said, what the fuck? Why are you going the opposite direction? And after the movie, I'm going to spoil for you, the only people that really lived were the people that went to the, the bottom of the boat. Fictional movie. But... Kind of a metaphor for the things that happen, right? For if you look at countries such as New Zealand, South Korea, right? Singapore. They never had a huge, they never had huge numbers. And you know what's funny? The countries like those, now, they were two different ends of the political spectrum. New Zealand's kind of a really democratic, socialist country, right? I mean, New Zealand banned nuclear-powered air um, um, naval ships from their from visiting their ports years ago because they're you know and just the way it is. But New Zealand came went down to zero, and South Carolina, which is kind of militaristic. But still a democratic nation. They're militaristic because they got a crazy... It's like having a guy next... South Korea has it. It's, it's like having a guy next door who has all these guns. And you said, oh my God. And he's threatening to kill you. You got to have a lot of guns. And you're just responding to his threats. Some of them sing idle and he thinks he does He does some encroachments and stuff like that. But we need another one. Two sides of the spectrum. Uh, they use similar precautions... And sim- similar things. And they reached the same conclusion. Similarly. We, on the other hand, had a huge resistance and all that stuff of people that said, we're not going to do that. It's phony or this, that. Oh, we, you know. And, and we'll go through all the stupid thing. We took advice from a lot of non-epidemiologists. Um, there's still one of these senators out there who is... Uh, an eye doctor who has a bunch of theories, you know. It's like asking a plumber uh, to, you know, work on your computer. Now, a plumber can have specific t- skills, but usually a plumber's best skills are resigned to the plumbing areas, right? Even though you can be a plumber and know this stuff, but the computer repair is usually best to have a computer repairman fix that or whatever technologist I should say uh, a computer technician right so that's that's the way it is so we had all these things we go back and forth we argued over these we fought over these things people went ape shit 
I've seen it firsthand. I've gotten in arguments with people. And part of it was my this, um, an inability to understand them better. Why are people doing that? Why do they care? I, I realize there must be a range of motivations that occurred. That people say, you know, this. I, I realize some young, beautiful women or you know, people that really see their face as an a- asset, they hated wearing the fucking mask. What? Are you kidding me? You want me to cover... I'm putting my hand across my face. You know that thing. You want me to cover this up? This is my best asset. It's like telling a girl that just got all this plastic surgery, got new you know, ass, new tits, and all that stuff. Well, you're going to have to wear a burqa. A shapeless burqa. She'd be like, fuck you. You know? I didn't get all this done on my tits and ass not to show it. And then you got the dual thing. Imagine the person that gets it and says, why are you staring at my tits? My size 55. Triple D. There's my eyes are up here. Well, okay. I'm sorry. I mean, some people are born that way. I understand. But I'm... We've had this debate in house sometimes with the wife. I'm just I, I sidetrack again. So that's that illness. There's people's being stuck at home. The isolation thing. Remember, if uh, you're a student of history, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, there were certain proponents of in the penal system of isolation is the best way to. Uh, punish criminals. And isolation became form of the punishment. Originally, you thought it was part of the reform process. The reform process, meaning, oh, well, the problem with criminals is interact- them interacting with them. You keep them, keep them isolated and they can reflect on their transgression and hopefully reach a contact with you know, their higher spiritual power or reflection or whatever. I don't think reflection was one of the things. They always thought it was like prayer or meditation or they didn't even talk about meditation, prayer. But whenever I say meditation, think of prayer, the same thing. And it turned out people used, they realized people came out crazy when you isolated them. When you put them in a a box. In during prisoners of war, they do it to prisoners of war. They don't do it to be kind to them in prison wars. They put them in isolation because it's the best way, keeping them away from human contact. A lot of people could not handle that isolation, even though at the time, if you think about it, at any point in history, up until this point, it's the best time to be isolated because of your access to at least video uh, interaction with people. And then you had PPP applications you could use to get somewhat closer to the people and they'll say, well, we can do this, we can do that, you know. And then there's uh, certain testing that you could do. And then you, or you could do long time, you know, the big thing was people were looking for their winter you ever hear that term, the winter? That was a new... I never knew it existed. But it existed before this thing. And winter means that when people... In the wintertime, people tend not to pair off as uh, much. So if you don't have one, time winter rolls around, you see it roll around not doing it. But luckily, I never understood that because I used to... When I was single, I had no problem meeting Girls in the wintertime. Women. I met I met a girl on Valentine's Day. Well, I wasn't with someone at that time. Just to let you know. Because that's a particular shitty thing to do. When it's Valentine's Day and you're not, you know. You're not, you're not, you're with someone and you go out and you meet someone else. I mean, I was bad when I was single, but I was never that bad. It's one of those things. I was a drunk. But I wasn't drunk enough that I pissed in someone's face. That's the way we cope with things, right? So we're talking about winter, pairing off, isolation, 
uh, ostracization from your families because of different views. Think about the arguments you get with people. And with it being a political year, and we have particular divisive politics right now, compounding that, we had people just particularly going totally apeshit on both sides. On both sides. They just couldn't handle it. We could not handle it. And the bar for crazy was moved. When things are all well and good, it is certainly easy to show a modicum of reasonableness. Reasonable, reasonableness. God, sometimes I have a problem with the bees, don't I? But when things aren't so good, and things, think about it. We are not, you know, World War II, it seemed like during World War II, people were singular in when you have a vision of an enemy who's seeking to subjugate you, you get a certain amount of people that pull together, right? Let's, and I'm going to throw another, This I always use history in my, think of France, Right? World War II. Pick France. I know. Historically, people say, oh, they're surrender monkeys and stuff like that. Well, hey, you know what? They had their manpower. You know, the critical um, age uh, group of 18 to 40-year-olds during uh, just 20 years prior, 22 years prior, wiped out. Practically, World War One, and they were reticent to doing another war. So they invested all this money in the in defense. So when they were, when a resurgent Germany spent all their money that they had at the time in the 30s to build up, and when it got near the top of it, decided, well, we didn't build this. We didn't get all dressed up for nothing. They decided to attack. You know, they attacked a fixed defensive positions that were built, that were planned for like 20 years early and completed like 10 years later, 12 years later with state-of-the-art mobile systems, artillery and tanks and the Luftwaffe, where they were not prepared. They were using old material, old tactics and things like that. So they were easily overwhelmed with old, their old tactics. So they were hard to regroup and stuff, and they, you know, and they call them surrender monkeys because they surrender. Because they, you know, if you if you don't have the right tactic or leaders in your armies, you can't do anything about it. So, so the point is, a group of people in France, they were so defeated. Some of them said, "Well, we can't do anything." So there's some new leaders. So you had the Vichy, and that was a, a the Vichy French named after the town in southern France where they collaborated with their attackers, the Germans. And then you had this other group called the Free French, led by a young uh, general, Charles de Gaulle, who, I guess, you know, that, that and then you had the underground, the French underground, and you had other people that the, the Nazis did not gravitate to, that which was like the Communist Party and stuff like that. They were automatic. The Communists were naturally anti fascists because of their hatred for each other. But then you were French nationalists. De Gaulle was nowhere near a communist. De Gaulle was just a French nationalist. But they joined together and they did it. And you'd have to say that there was enough collaborators with the Germans to be able to seize power because you had people on the inside collaborating with a conqueror. And it doesn't have to be... You You easily say, you can easily think that France was majority collaborative. No, there wasn't. Most of the French did not want the Germans there. And it was only, you only need a small group of collaborators to help administer, because how many people are actually, you need need less than maybe one-tenth. So a group, this small group of people who collaborated made it appear as if, oh, well, they just collapsed. No, there's always a small group of people that would collaborate because they're cowards. Or they're, 
you ever see cat? Well, it's the same thing. So they, they just go away and they just don't pull together. And that's we have people here that are selfish. We have selfish people that, you know, and there's other people that for different reasons that supported them too. And they, they bought into the, the bullshit. The, the bullshit that this isn't a thing. Now, if you only look in the United States, you could probably find it easier to believe the bullshit. But this is international with all different countries and all different types of governments. You had communist governments. You had pseudo, you know, pseudo-fascist governments. You have de- democratic governments. You have democratic socialist governments. And they all reacted similarly or differently. And think of the governments that acted differently than we did. The most extreme. People always bring, was it Sweden? Was it Sweden that decided to do herd mentality? And then the health minister said, you know, we really shouldn't have done that. That's their health minister. Because he was the one that said, he said, yeah, maybe we should do this. But it's a bigger country that in, their, in Iraq, it's not, it, when I say bigger country, it's not as big a country. It doesn't have huge population centers. It has some big cities, but people were somewhat reasonable and stuff like that there. And it's a colder country. It, it, it's just different. It was different altogether. So it's hard to compare. But there were so many other countries that were successful, were very successful, of different ilk. And the ones that weren't successful, the most apparently being United States, India, Brazil, and somewhat Russia, were similar in one way. They all had certain types of governments. Well, India didn't have the, the resources. It's just a huge country. And it's so compacted. 1.4 million. 1.4 billion people. 1.4 billion. And Brazil, around, the, you know, maybe 30 million less than we are. But they had this uh, kind of right-wing populace, much like our former uh, leader here. There was more into, when they say populace, appealing to a certain base instinct in people saying, you yeah, know, don't worry about this. You know, they don't want to get into the, first of all, it would cost a lot. It would be restrictions. And then his base, his base really didn't want to do the things that were required of him. It's like trying to be the popular teacher in high school. Yeah, it's all right. We go on a field trip. You can, you can drink a little booze and smoke some pot. I know we're not supposed to do it, but you know, I'm the cool teacher. And that's the kind of, and, and then what happens, you get a bunch of kids getting in a car and then crashing a car because they're drunk. And you go, well, how the fuck did this happen? Well, the cool teacher let us get drunk and smoke, you know, and not to smoke a pot, it makes you crash a car. I think drinking and doing stupid shit. Okay, so I'm getting a little more away from the crazy thing. But so we had a very divisive in the United States. We had very divisive. But you got to remember, it happened worldwide. And if you think worldwide, there's there's co- countries where they're not making money. They're not making money from the vaccine in the African countries. They got to give vaccines to them. They don't have the resources to do it. But people, the World Health Organization say, hey, listen, we got to get it. We got to donate it to these countries because this is where the variants are going to occur in these pl- places we don't have unchecked. I think I may have said it. I said variants. Did I say? I may. I think I may have said it. But I've been pretty successful. I'm at the end of the show. So we got all these people, different reactions and stuff like that. We have people that hate it and love it, and they just get on worse and worse. And they're we're supporting each other's crazy ideas. And there had been some crazy ideas out there. Like a huge belief that uh, the, ele- the previous election was stolen, even though a lot of people, a lot of Republicans believe it wasn't. And then when you get to the state elected officials and stuff like that, the people that work in their election, luckily they weren't conspiracy theorists. But there were tons of them that think, insist it was stolen. Even their numbers, they're hiding numbers. 
that the former president isn't as popular as he was. They're hiding numbers from the party for some reason. I think what they're worried about mainly is people that have been radicalized. And we have a large people that are radicalized, and that could be crazy. Hate, hate is a powerful tool for radi- radicalizing people. Hate. And uh, right at this time, you have uh, a lot of hard feelings in the United States. People not talking to each other. There's family members I know. I, I don't discuss because every time I talk to them, they get back into it. And they'll start talking. They, for some reason, they have to say shit. You know? I, you know what's so funny? During... You know, I did say things on, on a podcast about... I have these feelings, but I only speak, I spoke my mind to people that choose to want to listen to it. Because obviously you cannot convince someone, you cannot convince someone that exercise is good for you, let's say. When they say, well, you only have a certain amount of energy in your body. If you exercise, you're using it up. It's not, it, doesn't, it does not provide significant increase in, a, in your health or your well-being. How are you going to convince someone of that? If they're going to sit and say, well, the best thing for me is to sit on this couch, eat some Doritos and a pint of haagen That's my lifestyle. And it works for me. Yeah, I made me on my 600-pound life uh, next year. I'm auditioning for it. I may move to a quart of ice cream. And that'll get me there. So as we all start emerging from isolation and disagreement we start seeing these things as they're reflecting back and say wow it's hard to do it like when when things are being lifted restrictions are being lifted and the things about the mask and about travel people are going to say what the fuck happened why did I feel this way some people on one side may say oh you know what I shouldn't have been so hard on that person. I didn't know what they were going through. And hopefully on the other side, it may be the thing where the scales fall off their eyes. And they say, well, you know, maybe this was serious. I just couldn't face it. Well, that was a close one, right? When you, you get out of a thing of danger, you did not know it was dangerous at the time, but you find out, wow, I was kind of lucky. Or my family was lucky. We were fortunate. So... Hopefully that yawn or that relief will add people a little perspective and say, you know what, the next time something happens, maybe I should be a little more circumspect, reflective on what's the end goal. Like the end goal for me was I had this circle of things. First my family and then my friends and then my community and then as go by, I think my country and then the world. I want people to be healthy and happy. In general, everyone's not going to be, everyone can't be happy at all times. Just humans aren't made that way. But we can provide an atmosphere where the most amount of people can have the materials and let's say the base for Choosing to have a happy life. And part and big part of that is mental health. And we've got to be prepared for that. Because once, you know, when you know when some, per, some people isolate, they don't do well. Other people write wonderful treaties. Like the German uh, Lutheran pastor who was jailed by the Nazis at the beginning of World War II. Held in isolation, he had his, his what he wrote was the doctrine for how how the, you know we feel about fascist regimes and stuff like that, and how regular people can resist, and how you can be spiritually fit or mentally fit to be able to survive those things. So we can take it. We can take a little time right now. Not on the podcast, but to, to 
to reflect on these things that happened in the, in the past 16 months and say, what would have been better? What had, is it possible I held beliefs that were counter to the thing that was better? Did I want it to be better? Does it really care? My point was some people are dead enders. They want everything to fall around them. Don't trust those people. What's their end game? What is their end game? Just ask someone, what what is your goal? What is your goal? What is the perfect America for you? What is the perfect? Tell tell me what is it. And, and, And have them go in detail. In the end. What happens to poor people? What happens to people that, you know, refugees and things like that? And how, how should the poor be treated? How should they be educated? How, what is the goal for the country? What's the end game? Where, where's our place in the, in, the, in the world? Now, if it says at the top, every country on the bottom, or as a member of the family of nations, healthy family members participating in Advancing humankind, advancing humankind, making it healthier. You could kind of trust that person, making it healthier. But if it's healthier, it's like through, like, well, only white people, people like me, then you can kind of see where the person's agenda is. And I'm, it's not okay. I'm not going to say it's okay. Because it's usually whatever they have this solution is something at the detriment of someone else. And it's selfish. And you cannot cure selfishness. It, selfishness can, can only cure itself by some revelation. Say, you know what? I'm generally a happier person when I view other people, when I give them a little benefit of the doubt and don't lock into a hard feeling about them. Because people that always, some people run on anger. You can't do, and that feeds into that mental health issues. You're feeding, you're feeding that devil inside you and and it's gladly will take some bad information and make it healthier and bigger so you know you just have to ask yourself do you want to be happy and part of being happy is healthy you know good mental health i have been better and worse at different times but my goal is always to be feel better and treat and, and that part of it is treating other people better. And I hope I can do that. And I do appreciate you for listening. And if you do like the show, please share it with your friends. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Even though, you know, I don't do a lot, but the more listeners I get, the more the thing I do, and the more more listeners I get, the more time I spend on this and the possibility of, you know, reaping uh increasing my resources to be able to spend more time doing this. But you may not say, hey, Jim, you spend enough time doing this because I can't listen to any more of this drivel. Well, that's fine, too. But I do appreciate you listening. If you have any questions, please send them to Jim at KeysBartender.com. That's Jim at KeysBartender.com. Thank you for listening to KBBS. Keys Bartender Bullshit on the Asshole Network. Take care. We're signing out right now.